Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Hero Movie Podcast, your greatest source for superhero movie discussion in the multiverse. I am your host, Adam Portress, and I'm joined today by Sweet Shonzi from the internet. We're changing the theme of this podcast into a true crime podcast. And of course, the McGruff crime dog of this podcast, Bruce Leslie. I'm a prickly pear, and the hook's going to be that one of us committed the murder. Bum, bum, bum. Yes, we are out in uh, putting on all of our favorite disguises. We're playing dress up today because we're talking about The Saint from 1997. That's right. That Val Kilmer movie that you vaguely remember from the late 90s actually has uh, comic book connections to it. We'll get into those. And of course, as always, how this movie relates back one to one to Sylvester Stallone. It happens on every show. You should get on top of it. Stay tuned. Uh, before we get going, though, we do want to thank everybody who drops five star reviews over at this uh, over at the iTunes. There, five star reviews, aka humdingers. Humdinger. We haven't had one in quite some time. We always kind of want to throw that out there to you guys because that helps get this program out to other people. And when that program gets to other people, they listen and it affects their lives. And you know what they do after that? They go to patreon.com slash HMP, and they join up just like our good buddy Derek Copeland here. Derek jumped in at, get this, boys, whoo, back up to Brink's truck. Derek coming in at the $40 level. Derek, oh, my goodness, buddy. Thank you. Thank you absolutely, Derek. And uh, you Thank know what? Thank you for joining the Patreon, there, fella. Best part about this, Derek, you get yourself a little bit of swag and stuff as well. So drop your uh, t-shirt size there to me in an email, and uh, we'll get you out an exclusive t-shirt. I'll design a new one uh, right off top. I think maybe we'll see, uh, but we'll get you one and uh, all that kind of good stuff. And again, he can go put that executive producer credit on anything he wants to put that on his resume. Whenever he goes into his next job, they're going to look on that and be like, "He's an executive." executive producer what is this they'll call me up and i will vouch for him and then he's going to get the job you know why because he's an awesome person that's what derek does and you know what we do to awesome people we give them hmp nicknames uh bruce sean uh, i have given it to you boys to give derek his new uh name let's have it i'll let you take yeah. the honors here sean okay all right well you know bruce and i man bruce and i went down to the lab and uh, we 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 knocked it around for a couple hours. Um, Intense, you know, with a with a with a name like Derek Copling, you know, you, you need to have a really really solid HMP nickname. And so, you know, there's a lot of cups of coffee consumed. Uh, I myself, I had probably two and a half packs of cigarettes. There's a lot of crumpled papers. Uh, like old boxes of Chinese food it's all over the table in work. the lab. Important work. It the really moment. was important work. We have that moment where we throw everything away and start from square one again. Right. From the top. Right. And finally, Derek Copling, we have come up with your HMP nickname. It is Sir Slick Derek the Night Bard. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I am going to give you one guess who came up with the second half of that <laughs> name. Does his name rhyme with Schmoosh Mesley? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Derek, there you go, man. Holy smoke. So, uh, again, you can uh, tell all your friends you're an executive producer. Use it, use, it to, uh, use it to your romantic advantage. That's what I always say. I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a bit of a cards. producer. Yeah, make business cards. Executive producer of an award-eligible podcast. Award-eligible. That's the best. <laughs> That's the most best description of us ever. So uh, uh, you can be like Derek and, of course, many other people over at patreon.com slash HMP. I know what some of you are thinking. What do you get with that? You get the pre-show, the post-show, and, of course, the Dinger Zone. Uh, that is where we talk about the day's topics, be they news or just uh, a bit of random this and that. You get some behind-the-scenes action. So to get all that good stuff and more head on over to patreon.com slash hmp and join up today we appreciate you uh before we get going though we also have uh, something else we don't get a whole lot of around here let's open up the old mailbag fails here and this one comes to us from a patreon supporter uh brian from rockland new york 
Uh, guys, if you ever reach a lull in films to cover, I just learned that Marvel Comics released an adaptation of Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. It got nominated for an Eisner Award. I think it would be a lot of fun to cover Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, which I find to be the pinnacle of stupid fun. Where else do you learn that Beethoven's favorite works are Handel's Messiah, Mozart's Requiem, and Bon Jovi's Slippery When Wet? In the meantime, be excellent to one another. Brian from Rockland, New York. Brian, thanks for the email, buddy. And, of course, for uh, being a Patreon uh, supporter over there as well. Uh, we were kind of talking about this a little bit in the pre-show, and uh, I think we're actually going to wait in, uh, when that new Bill & Ted movie comes out in the theaters. Uh, we'll have a uh, another fine, fine film, hopefully fine film, to uh, check out. So uh, thanks for that, and we'll, uh, get, we'll, we'll do it up, right? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Because uh, my, my guess is, knowing the age of everyone on this podcast, you two were probably like big fans of Bill and Ted. Would I be correct in that assumption? I was obnoxiously so. That yeah, that especially makes sense. I said, I am, I am the rare case. I love Bogus Journey. I love, love, love Bogus Journey. Wow. So, yeah. uh, you know, Adam, did we... Did we get an email from uh, Matthew Van Diver? Uh, not recently, I don't believe. No, because uh, he said that he sent it just before our Super Lopez episode. He might have. Let me see. But yeah, I uh, I think it's getting to be more, I, I don't know if I'll say more, but I'll say not uncommon for people to appreciate that Bogus Journey is really uh, the the superior of the two movies. Now, at the time of release, I was so all in for uh, Excellent Adventure that I don't know if I really appreciated Bogus Journey for being good or I just liked it because it was more Bill and Ted. But, you know, with age, I think that's the one that uh, uh, maybe people tip their hat to a little bit more, Sean. Is that has that been your experience? Well, I just love I love the the character of death. I, I think he's such a great character in that movie. He makes me laugh all the time. Um when I met William Sadler, I even asked him about it. And I said, uh, how often do people know that you're death from Bill and Ted? And he said, you're probably the fifth person to ever bring that up. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's a, I mean, I guess that's a good thing in a way that, uh, you know, you have people bugging you about it. I did, actually. I, I looked up and I, I, I got a secular man's uh, email here. For some reason, I guess it went to the spam folder or something. That doesn't that doesn't make me happy. So I'm going to flag that to make it appropriate. But I'll go ahead and uh, read that off. It's entitled Best of the Decade. I'm going to go to bat for someone that didn't even get a mention. And I think it's a big oversight. That person is Agent Peggy Carter of several MCU film, films and the Agent Carter TV series, as played by the absolutely wonderful Haley Atwell. Peggy Carter is greater than Supergirl. The TV series can't hold a candle to Agent Carter. Better than Wonder Woman and just greater than any other female in the MCU because she's an amazing hero who is even more amazing because she has no superpowers nor has she undergone, ridic undergone ridiculous training like Black Widow. All she has is her guts and gumption. She's also, more, she's also more of a positive message to women than any other character that we've seen so far, just because of those traits and others. It's just awful that she did not receive more focus over the years because, of her, contribution, because her contributions cannot be ignored. Thank you. Uh, that is from our good friend Secular Man. Uh, agreed. Yeah, man, I love Peggy Carter and I love uh, Haley Atwell. She's a an absolutely wonderful person. Had a nice little uh, personalized note for my daughter on a, an autograph that I got. Please from get away from my table. Love <laughs> Haley Atwell. <laughs> and I'm a big fan, very big fan. Yeah, I can't believe that we that that we uh, that we didn't say that a whole uh, really any love on that show and uh, big oversight by us. But thanks for bringing that up, Matt. You are absolutely correct. Uh, I think. Uh, all big fans around around the HMP offices. Yeah, I not me. I hate Peggy Carter. You are a lion, so and, and so. We've got audio <laughs> no, proof. I love Peggy Carter. Man. <laughs> there's no, I, I was, I, there's I was no way. You, could, you guys when they canceled the show. <laughs> there's no way you could hate Haley Atwell. You know, she's that's impossible. Yeah, I ain't made of stone. I'm just a regular man like everybody else, and all of you regular people can email us like these fine folks over at HeroMoviePodcast at gmail.com. Let's close up the old mailbag. 
Bales here. Uh, Remember that day that you guys, uh, I think it was the first Infinity, I think it was Infinity War, where you guys insisted that we read like 17 emails at the same time? <laughs> this would be the week to do it, because then we have yes. to talk about the same very little. <laughs> Whereas with Infinity War, we needed to talk about Infinity War, and you were like, no, no, let's read 17 emails after our review. This would be the week. You know, we need to maybe stockpile emails so these weeks that we have episodes like this, we could just kind of like have some internal lingo that said, yeah, this is a mailbag week. Like, yeah, we'll we'll mention who's in the movie and we'll give it a Robin rating, but this is a mailbag week. I really <laughs> enjoy, Joyce, your, your first episode about, uh, about Daredevil. And you're like, wait a minute, how long have they been storing these emails? We're we're writing emails to each other so we don't have to talk about a movie on a certain <laughs> Just coming up with the aliases and things of that nature. And go and my, Bruce, name is Luce, H- my name is Luce Brester. And I gotta tell you, I love comic books. <laughs> Bruce would like go a little bit too far and then send some sort of a drawing or a picture of someone he thinks is this character that he's writing in as. It's like no one else sends like an I you know, a photo ID. <laughs> along with their emails, but it, Bruce does because he thinks this guy's thorough. It's just it's a, a podcast. <laughs> it's just a photograph of me with the Mario mustache over top my existing beard. <laughs> well, that's great. He's a heck of a, a king of disguise over there. All right, so uh, this week we're talking about the saint. Can you tell that we don't want to talk about it all that much, but we're gonna. Uh, so let's go ahead and listen to the trailer for the saint. A man without a name, can never be identified. We've got a handful of false identities used on visas, passports. My name is Bruno Hartenfaust. I am Ivan Rovich. I'm Tony. Tony St. Hubbins. A man who doesn't exist can never be caught. I've been chasing him for nearly two years. He eluded a hit squad this morning in Holland Park. A man who doesn't love can never truly be alive. This woman has discovered something that will revolutionize the world. It's a formula for creating energy. You will steal it for me. How did you do that? Magic. When we master this technology, then we dictate terms to the West. Give it up! You got no place to go! I escaped. I always escape. Pictures presents Nicholas Owen, Louis Guinella, Peter Damien, all the names of Catholic saints. A story about betrayal. You've got to get away from me. I'm not going anywhere until you tell me why you lied to me. You don't know what you're dealing with here. Redemption. I can't trust anybody. I never have. And destiny. Kill him. And bring her to life. If you want to live, you can leave my side. From the director of Clear and Present Danger and Patriot Games. The army must be mobilized. The balance of power is about to shift. Val Kilmer. Tell me you love me. Elizabeth Shue. Who are you? The Saint. Alrighty, that was the trailer for the Saint from Even 19. The trailer sucks. Yeah, it's uh, it's the '90s, man. What are you gonna do? This is uh, directed by Philip Noyce. Uh, sadly, this is not too Noyce as the uh, the the Key and Peel would do. Let's go ahead and do it. Uh, break it open. Come on, computer, work with me here. Now, oh, for heaven's sake, you can do it, Tony. Come on, Tony. Tony, you jackass! I hate your guts. Why are you? Jeez. You know, you cut somebody's coffee budget a little bit. I mean, because we're trying to save money around here. Thanks to people like Derek, it's going to get better and the coffee can be here and uh, Tony can wake up a little bit more. But, my, get it together, Tony. Jeez Louise. Bruce, please. Up, yeah, up in the Sanka next week. My God. Uh, the Saint, Saint often God. referred to as the Robin Hood of modern crime, was created by Leslie Charteris. And first appeared in the novel, Meet the Tiger, that was published in September 1928. 
The saint is a character known as Simon Templar, and since his initials are ST, people call him the saint. He's portrayed as a noble thief in the tradition of Robin Hood and has seen many incarnations. He's been described as a buccaneer in the suits of Seville Row, amused, cool, debonair with hell for leather, blue eyes, and a saintly smile. His origin remains a mystery, but he is explicitly British, though there are references which suggest he spent a little bit of time in the United States during Prohibition battling guys like Al Capone. In his original incarnation, the saint is independently wealthy, which is the best kind of wealthy, if you ask me, and he has a manservant named Oris. In his first published adventure, the British scoundrel meets his on-again, off-again love interest, Patricia Holm, uh, who is played by Eliza Dushku, by the way, in the unpicked-up television pilot. Hmm. An ongoing nemesis for the saint would appear in the form of Scotland Yard detective Claude Eustace Teal, who's dedicated to putting Templar behind bars. The saint would be portrayed on British television by not-yet-James Bond actor Roger Moore, but what I'm most interested in is the character's run in comics. The Saint comic strip appeared in American newspapers beginning in 1948, initially drawn by artist Mike Roy. Roy was born in Quebec, and he was a co-founder of a museum of Native American and Eskimo art, which makes it no surprise that he may be best known for his comics with Native Americans as key characters. His first job in comics came in 1940 as an assistant artist on Submariner, for Marvel predecessor Timely Comics, and he also worked on Captain America, Archie Comics, and Flash Gordon. In 1951, when John Spranger replaced Roy as the artist, he altered the Saint's appearance by depicting him with a beard. Then in 1959, Lil Abner artist Bob Lubbers took over. Now, you may not know this, Sean, but in addition to being a comic strip artist, Bob Lubbers also played trombone in a big band five nights a week. After a year, Lubbers was replaced by Doug Wildly, who's probably best known for creating Johnny Quest, and he drew the strip until it ended in 1961. Concurrent with the comic strip, Avon Comics published 12 issues of the Saint comic book between 1947 and 1952, which I believe were just collections of the newspaper strip. And the 1960s TV series is unusual in that it is one of the few major programs of his genre that was not ad adapted as a comic book in the United States. However, in Sweden, The Saint had a long-running comic book published from 1966 to 1985 under the title Helgonet. One of the main writers for Helgonet was Norman Worker, a British writer known for his work on The Phantom. Norman was arguably the most popular writer of the Scandinavian Phantom comics, but to be honest, I'm not sure who's having that argument. And a new American comic book series was launched by Moonstone in the summer of 2012, but it never went beyond a single promotional issue zero. Since 2012, no comic book saint sightings have been confirmed, but since he's the sneaky sort of fellow and a master of disguise, he might be right under our noses and we would never know it. Oh, I think we would know it if it was uh, Val Kilmer behind it, because. but we'll talk about that in just a second. Here's the would, idea. Would, mm -hmm. would you guys like to be in the room with the people that are arguing over who the best Scandinavian phantom rider was? <laughs> they're, 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 that person doesn't exist. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I've... When when you get to uh, a lot of the kind of bowels of Dragon Con, or like the hotel rooms where like you know you don't know that you should be walking down that hallway, there's some stuff in you. I nothing would surprise me at this point. I've seen I've I've seen some things. I know stuff. What What's the worst thing you've ever seen for real? Uh, it was. Uh, it was a rather, rather long, long, giant line of people who were uh, headed into this uh, BDSM festival type thing, uh -huh. and um, the uh, they, you know, never the people that you want to see. Of course, it's it's very much of that uh, HBO uh, kind of vibe thing going on, where you're just like, oh, there's there's nothing about this that I would have any interest in. Goodbye. And they look at you I'm like still, you're a weird nerd, and you're just like, I'm not nearly as weird as you people who are into you know crazy Japanese uh, animation that's uh, uh, of the adult nature. 
I was in a room that had a very lively argument about whether He-Man and the Masters of the Universe animated series increased or decreased the value of its predecessor, Black Star. You see, they exist. It's it's unbelievable. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Here is the IMDb plotline. As we know, IMDb always 100% correct in everything they say and or do. Simon Templar, the saint, is a thief for hire whose latest job is to steal the secret process for cold fusion. Puts him at odds with a traitor bent on toppling the Russian government as well as the woman who holds its secret. This is starring Val Kilmer, Elizabeth Shue, and Ray Roddy. I can never pronounce this man's name, but you know him. You've seen him in everything. If you need a, Ru- a Russian, you know, jerkwad, this is the guy you go with. Yeah. Now, I'll just go ahead and start things off by saying I really used to like Val Kilmer. Like, uh, am I wrong or wasn't there a time where, like, guys thought Val Kilmer was cool, especially, like, teenage guys, adolescents? Well, here's the – here here. let me uh, – because I have the absolute thing that dovetails quite nicely into what you're saying. I am, you know, uh, around some like-minded people one day, and we're hanging out. And the the subject of Val Kilmer comes up, and I hadn't seen The Saint. And it had just come out, and it wasn't doing very well. And I said to, just just to the ether, I was like, how is that movie not doing well? Doesn't everybody love Val Kilmer? And a guy turns to me, and he says, no, I hate Val Kilmer. <laughs> And, and I was, and I'm thinking Val Kilmer, you know, like real genius Val Kilmer, like the, the Val Kilmer of, uh, you know, like not this movie and yeah. <laughs> like Top Gun where he's yeah. like a prick, but he's your prick, you know, that kind of thing. And he, and, and, and all, and he starts naming off things that he had been in that I had never seen at the time. And I was like, oh yeah he's in some bad movies and he's bad in those bad movies. And I had totally forgotten about that. And so the, like the writing was on the wall for him pretty early because he is a jerk. Like in real life, he's a jerk too. So like when you hear things like on the, you know, on the set of the saint that the poetry that the character wrote is actually written by Val Kilmer, it's oh, some yeah. eye rolling crap. You know what I mean? And, and I can remember an interview with him where he's he's talking about how he really wanted this one sweater that the saint should wear. And he basically stopped production so that they could find the sweater that he really wanted. Like that's that's needless and stupid. There's no there's no reason for that. And and so he's one of those guys where, you know, if you behave the way that he behaves, you aren't going to work in Hollywood forever. And, and that's been the case with him. Now, will you guys indulge me a little bit about my uh, uh, roller coaster ride with Val Kilmer? Okay. Sure. Uh, first off, I'll say that my personality formed, like what would become my personality formed the day I watched Top Secret. His I, first I movie. A, <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's a surprise. Like that was a movie that, that really hit right at the, the entertainment level I was looking for. Um, <laughs> I'd probably seen Real Genius before Top Secret, but I watched it again after Top Secret, and I really appreciated Val Kilmer. Uh, of course, I liked uh, Iceman from Top Gun, like you've already said there, Sean. I even liked like Val Kilmer in this terrible movie. I think it was called Thunderheart or something like that, where he's supposed to be a Native American cop or mm-hmm. a cop on Native American reservation, something like that. Yep. Terrible movie, but I liked it. I think I even was able to pretend like I liked The Island of Dr. Moreau, I'm not sure what year that came out. Um, but, but 1996. Really, if you're a person who already liked Val Kilmer and then you saw Tombstone, I mean, it was, it was over with. Uh, like Doc Holliday and Tombstone, if you already liked Val Kilmer, seeing that performance was like suddenly, okay, this, this is going to be my favorite actor for the rest of my life, which is wrong. He is not. But like, <laughs> I, I think that's the role that, it, that the few people that were holding back on Val Kilmer – I think a lot of the floodgates were broken open with that I'll be your Huckleberry stuff, right? Yeah. I, I think a lot of it, too, though, is for me, what I've found over the years is not always, but by and large, Val Kilmer really works as a supporting character. He is not a leading man. When you look at his best films, you know, you got your top secret, like you said, Top Gun, uh, 
Willow, and then uh, oh, what do you call it there? Uh, of course, Tombstone, Batman. Uh, but Batman doesn't count. Kiss, Heat, kiss, bang, bang. Kiss, kiss, bang, hey. bang. Like all of his, all of his best stuff. The stuff that you would like, Pollock. Things that he's in for like a hot second does well enough, and then kind of moves on. Those are the things that he's best in. He's best in very small doses and everything, but the second that you go, hey, go hog wild with this, uh, that ain't the guy you want to be giving hog wild passes to. And this movie came out in 97. I saw it on home video, so I probably saw it in 98. And that was when I, you know, it's like that was when I decided I didn't like Val Kilmer anymore. It all goes back to the Saints. So I carry a lot of negative baggage with this movie before watching it for only the second time, what, uh, 20 plus years later now. So let's talk about why you might dislike Val Kilmer in this uh, Simon Templar role. Uh, by I, the thing that you know just kind of drove me bonkers more than anything. This guy is kind of a uh, well. This whole movie itself. Let's let's let me start here. Actually, this is 1997. What happened in 1996? Do you guys remember? There was this giant film called Mission Impossible. It was freaking amazing. Everyone loved it. Giant hit at the box office. And they were like, we got something that kind of has a spy sort of vibe to it. This Mission Impossible thing is huge. I promise you that is what put this movie into production. And that's probably what I was expecting to see when I watched this back in 98, because I really liked that first Mission Impossible movie. Um, have, have you guys read the long list on Wikipedia of people who turned down this role? No. <laughs> no. Because first off, I think casting an American as the saint is like cast. Uh, it's a lesser version of casting an American as James Bond, but the saint is a very British character. I mean, the uh, because of Roger Moore's performance as the saint, he got the chance to play James Bond. Right. But, uh, you know, they wanted a British actor. So first they went after this is all per Wikipedia, which who knows how accurate that is. Yeah. But they went after Hugh Grant, which... Looking back, that might have been pretty. It might have been a good choice, yeah. I mean, later uh, on, did Ford, when he no, I'm looking forward really to much. seeing him in that Guy Ritchie movie coming up, The Gentleman. Uh, Kenneth Branagh or Branagh, however you pronounce it. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, then I think they gave up real quick on English actors, and they said, "You know who does a great English accent? Kevin Costner. Oh, he Lord. turned down the role. Uh, they went after Mel Gibson, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Christian Slater, George Clooney." Daniel Day Lewis. Now talk about some interesting casting. It's wow, okay. <laughs> that would have been a much different movie. Johnny Depp, and then eventually Val Kilmer. Man, but, when Val Kilmer is the bottom of that giant rung, holy smokes! They they just they were grasping at straws, man. And I think they had a script by one of the not not the guy, not Jeb Stewart, not the the people that wrote the original Die Hard, but the writers of one of the Die Hard uh, sequels. Had a script for this movie. Um, uh, the kid stays in the picture. Robert Evans is that his name? I think he was. Yep. Gonna yep. This Robert for Robert Evans is the producer, and it's it's written. I mean, you got Jonathan Hensley on it, who you know did you know a couple of the uh, the diehards there did the like diehards well, with the Avengers. guy I'm talking about. Yeah. but That's not the movie that got made. I mean, he still gets a script credit, but uh, I think he was so proud of his script and so disappointed with what they went with that you can still read this his version of the script for the Saint online. It's like. Got its own web page. Oh, so Wesley Stick is the other is the other gentleman. It, it sa- th- that script sounds pretty good. It's got a person falling out of an airplane in a wheelchair. I mean, it's got like some big scenes, like Mission Impossible level scenes. But then I also read that they were like, "Well, we've already got Mission Impossible. We want to make this something kind of different." And then it sort of became a Val Kilmer vanity project, is what it sounded like. We want to make it even better than the first Mission Impossible. Yeah, so good let's, luck. Let's have Val Kilmer play a lot of goofy characters. <laughs> Man, let's make sure he uses every accent except for an English accent. Uh, let's let him, like, really mope. Like, like he's still uh, a holdout for maybe five years earlier when you really did have some of the mopey. Like, didn't he play? Yeah, he played Jim Morrison, didn't he? He I did. I loved him as Jim Morrison. Honestly, <laughs> like, that, I, I like that Doors flick. Yeah, me too. But he's still I, I don't. Of, He's still kind of trying to bring a little bit of Jim Morrison where he just sits and talks absurdity in a quiet, slow pace, and that's supposed to be romantic. Like, is this supposed to be a romance at the end of the day? Because he is creepy as heck, man. They don't make this movie 20 years later like this and paint it as a romance. He's That's <laughs> funny because that, that, that's one of the points that I wanted to bring up today is that I'm glad that they don't make this movie anymore 
the guy acts like a complete jack wagon for the entire movie and he still gets the love interest at the end. She should have absolutely zero interest in this crazed lunatic by all <laughs> by all means. When you look at him, you're just like, oh, everything that this guy does says this is an absurd, crazy person that I need to run away from. How about I just fall in love with him instead? He should end up murdering her. I mean, he's stalking her. He's lying about who he is. He's dressing in disguises. He breaks into her apartment to learn more about her, then comes back later and, and sleeps with her under false pretenses. I mean, that whole thing, like, I know the first time I watched it, I checked out. I knew this wasn't the movie for me when he, like, takes out his pocket knife and cuts his forehead and lies in the alley where she can discover him and says, oh, I was thinking about your beauty and I got so distracted that I hit a wall. I was listening to a Morrissey record then I got really sad. And so, uh... and that's also when I checked out the second time through, strangely enough. But man, he is a, if this were made today, I don't know if either of you guys have watched the very popular show on Netflix called You, but if this were made today, it's, he's, he's that guy from You. He's Joe. He's the stalker. He's the psychopath that needs to be stopped i have not seen that show i hear watching messiah yeah i've heard good things my wife's been watching that one but uh yeah val kilmer man this is when i quit liking val kilmer um also this was the movie this was the movie that did this was the movie that did it and i was like okay it's not who he used to be and uh you said dr moreau was a year before this adam not, yeah, 96, I believe. So I stuck with him through that, but I honestly think something happened to him working with Brando and seeing what Brando got away with, and he tried to, like, out-Brando Brando on the demanding side of things. I could and see no, that. No, man, he's been doing that. He he had been doing that since even on Top Gun he was doing crap like that. Yeah, I mean, there's the apocryphal story about whatever island they're on. There was some endangered insect where there's, like, only maybe five of them left in the world, and he just ate one. Like, just picked it up and ate it, Val Kilmer did. Yeah, read about it. It's probably apocryphal, but it's out there. I say this, though. If you're if you're like a cray spider or something like that, to, to be able to see those, you know, those pristine chompers as the last thing before you die, could be worse. Pristine could, chompers. I mean, listen, I mean, Clint Howard's not going after that, you. That needs to be your internet name, Adam. Do, but, well, I uh, no. listen, I'm the furthest away from that. So if, if someone pays for my dental crap, I will go by, I will go by the name Pristine Chompers. I will do it. <laughs> and you know, around the time of MacGruber, that Val Kilmer um, had gained significant weight, right? Yeah, yeah. He a big boy now. He a thick boy. I like to imagine it's entirely from eating endangered, nearly extinct things. <laughs> I just go. Well, to it's the because of the. It's because of the cancer, correct? Well, it- I thought. Well, I thought he actually lost a lot of that weight he put up because of the cancer. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, I thought he had a little yo-yo in his weight. Uh, but what do I know, man? I don't know his details. But how about Elizabeth Shue? Is this the first movie she made after her um, Oscar-worthy turn in Leaving Las Vegas? Uh, if not, it's pretty close, I would say. Let me let me look at the actual years on that. Man, I can't believe... Like, I would have sworn she had to make this before Leaving Las nope, Vegas. Two years, after. Yeah, no, two years after. Yeah, two years after. 95. Uh, I know, and, and that's like... Re- Poor Elizabeth Shue. Why don't people give her some respect? I mean, she did one of the the great performances of the '90s there and leaving Las Vegas, and they give her this. Junk well, here's play, a here's the uh, thing, Bruce. Here's a, a little character. Here's a little history for you. Uh, up until just recently, the Best Actress uh, winner usually uh, th- her career kind of tanked after that. There is a- didn't, yeah. didn't didn't Catwoman come out the year after Monsters Ball? Mm-hmm. Or right, right then thereabouts. But like, I mean, it was there, like Annette Benning one, and then her career just kind of tanked. There was a good long. I mean, I think Charlize Theron's really one of the few that kind of stopped that trend and everything. And thankfully, those women are getting you know great deals now. But for I'd say a good fifteen plus year stretch, uh, you won an Academy Award for Best Actress. Uh, your career just kind of tanked. I don't know why. Yeah, I mean, she played this incredibly complex character in Las Vegas with her own demons, helping someone else battle their demons, uh, stuck between all kinds of challenges and being strong in the face of all these different things. Then here she's got to play literally the smartest physicist who has ever existed, but she still uh, has to fall for this POS guy, Simon Templar, who treats her terribly, to be honest. And then the next thing you know, also there's the weird effect with her that some guys have when they wear a suit. You know, sometimes you a guy puts on a suit and it looks like the suit 
just wants to like get off of that guy <laughs> as quickly as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and for her, it's a lab coat. Her wearing a lab coat, that lab coat wants to get off of her as quickly as humanly possible. Yeah, I mean, it, it's she is literally the smartest person in every room she's in. Her character, but man, they still have her like laugh like a schoolgirl at times and and act simple, which is they, ridiculous. Yeah, exactly, know, like for as smart as this character's supposed to be, she doesn't come off as all that bright, and that's and that's what kind of it, it makes you mad, really, because you're just like she's supposed to be the smart one in all this situation, and she just kind of looks like she's a little bit lost. And when they have their interactions and stuff together, there is one point in here where I'm telling you. I looked right at her face and I'm like, boy, does she not want to be talking to Val Kilmer right now? It's when and they're they're face to face and like and she's kind of half laughing at whatever joke or bull crap he's talking about. I'm like, ooh, look at her eyes. She does not want to be here. And I'm gonna contrast it to an example that's contemporary from the time this movie was made, but she does not have the Denise Richards as a physicist problem. Like no. Elizabeth Shue could very much convince you she's strong, smart. And in control. I mean, we saw her do that in the boys just this past year. Yeah, great. But, but she, so this isn't because she, it's not like Denise Richards. I don't care who's directing that or how it's <laughs> written. I'm not necessarily buying Denise Richards' physicist, but I could totally buy Elizabeth Shue if someone wasn't like, I, I'm sure somewhere, somehow, uh, she got, man, her performance got manipulated this way. Bruce, her name is Christmas Jones. What's not to like? Christmas Jones. I I, I was it was going back and forth. Is it Valentine? <laughs> nope. It Christmas? Because uh, Christmas only a comes once a year. Oh my God! It's the worst Bond line ever, and that's saying something for Bond movies. Hey, I'm a hardcore fan of Suzanne Summers, and her best character was Christmas Snow. So I'll go with that. <laughs> I don't, don't know that I saw that film. Oh, that was Three's Company. Chrissy's That's Three's Company. That's I know. I was, I, it was Christmas. I get it. Her father was a pastor. Uh, let's talk about his disguises, man, because his whole thing is he's supposed to be this great master of disguise. I love, love, Before love. Before we get into the nitty gritty of this, uh -huh. let's just bring up the fact that Val Kilmer believes he is killing it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. He is like Academy Award stuff right here. All of this, pure gold. But he's he's got he puts on all of these costumes and stuff, and he just looks awful. He looks like Val Kilmer in a costume, and like it's yeah. not even remotely close. You remember the first time when you saw Mission Impossible, and they have that Russian interrogation scene that you're watching on that CRT monitor, and then it pulls over, and then Tom Cruise rips off that, and you know this guy rips his face off, and it's Tom Cruise underneath. That was like holy crap. That was so good. This utter garbage. And also, in all fairness, I don't know how much was actually makeup in Mission Impossible and how much was we have one actor, then we stage the scene where they're ripping off the mask. And a lot a of it's it's a little bit of combination of both sometimes. It all it kind of depends on which it, scenes we're talking about. But the, the problem with Val Kilmer's makeup is, uh, uh, and I'm no, you know, I'm no acting expert or anything. Sure you are, so, sure you are. Keep going. But, but once, once you've sold something, Quit trying to sell it. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, he he he's not enough just with the little different hair and and the accent and maybe holding his body different. Then he's got to put in the big goofy teeth, the big goofy glasses. He's like like if you've never met this person before, it's immediately going to catch your attention because he is a caricature of something. And he's just constantly moving, so and he has some Bruce, kind of business. Go ahead. What, what were you saying there, Sean? I, I I am so surprised, Bruce, that you did not like. Val Kilmer in this movie because this feels like your thing. Hey, if he weren't being like uh, wanting to read his awful poetry in a fake Dutch boar accent uh, while he's lying in the street, maybe I would have liked him. Like if this were top secret and he was doing some of this stuff, I would have liked it. But he, you can tell that this is like him ruining a, sh a movie that could have been uh, tolerable. I don't know if it ever could have been great, but it could have been tolerable. And I really feel like he ruins it with some of his prolonged trying to show how great he is. Like Adam and, and you have already said, he thinks he's killing it and he's only killing me. He's looking in the mirror, <laughs> just kind of trying to get his accent the, a couple of times and stuff. And it's just like you could just see him going through his process here. Just like, yes, this is the voice that I would use. It is the Russian voice. It is good voice. Good voice. And it's, it's, it's just it's, terrible. 
And it's like you can't just do your standard French accent, English accent, German accent. You know Val Kilmer really thinks he's something because he's doing an Afrikaner Dutch boar accent. Like an accent that we're not going to recognize, you know? It just sounds like a fake accent to me. In fact, uh, if I ever meet a Dutch boar person, I'm going to ask them what they thought of his take on that. Terrible. But he's always he's always squirming. He's always kind of moving. Every bit of his characters always have too much business to do. And like anyone that would look at this person, you're like, why is this guy being so extra over here? He's just everything's just cranked up to eleven. It's like you are. I mean, I guess he's going for the uh, what hide in plain sight. I guess <laughs> make everyone notice you, and there's no way that they'll notice you. I don't know. And you know, I'd be so much more impressed if he just did the thing where he, like grab somebody's hat. Uh, alters his posture, pulls up his collar, and like squints his face a little bit, and you're kind of don't recognize him as Val Kilmer instead of all the overdone prosthetics. Dude, and stuff. I laughed so hard when he's like the maid or whatever in there. Oh, that that was just straight humor. I'm sorry, that wasn't even just like, <laughs> oh look, he, it, look at this clever thing yeah, that, that we've was, done. That was he's practically good. wearing a babushka, walking around dusting stuff, and just like got the info I need. Bye bye. <laughs> That was on par with uh, Dana Carvey's Master of Disguise, a, a movie I like better. That's than. all I could think of when I was watching this crap. It's just like, what other really crummy costume are we going to come out with here and just look like Val Kilmer in a costume? I think if you walked, you know, if that guy walked into, you know, any grocery store, everybody would be like, holy crap, Val Kilmer's here. And this is also post uh, interview with the vampire. So I feel like at some point, He's trying to be like a real world version of the vampire Lestat where he's so like internally tortured about the awful things he has to do, but he's doing them for good reason. Like at some point we're supposed to feel like he's this tortured soul that we want to to love and, and help. But all I'm seeing is a guy who's full of himself. Uh, one of my favorite parts is, like you uh, had mentioned previously there, Bruce, where he uh, decides to throw a ten- temper tantrum, throw himself down an alley and cut his head. The hilarious part, though, is that he cuts his head right at the hairline of his giant fake wig. <laughs> and I'm Why is she what? not going like, hold on? I mean, because here's the thing. I don't know if you know this, but ladies know more about this, you know, hair stuff and, you know, like wigs and all that stuff than guys do. Some people know more than others. We'll I, just leave it I just, I've, I've known many a woman who, like, know a lot about this crap. I've I known found far it surprising. more men who need to use them than women. So I'll, I'll, I know there are plenty of guys that uh, admire their hair pieces. Can we there. say this, though, boys? Uh, HMP crew here, full heads of hair on all of us. Isn't it lovely? And also, you guys out there with the rug, you're not fooling anybody. No, nah, but don't be ashamed of that rug. You rock that, baby. You do it. <laughs> I like it when they let the rest of their hair go gray, but still keep the rug like a Christmas vacation Well, style. you know, it's like you got to have the little salt and the pepper in there. Make some, you know. But also, Master of Disguise always carries 14 different goatees and 13 different wigs. And How they're about you all little- awful. Every How about one you of them sucks. Keep a little fake blood in your pocket. You know, keep a little fake blood in your pocket. <laughs> He needs all kinds of stage accoutrement is what you're trying to say? Well, he's like a professional wrestler. He's blading himself to sell it when he could probably get away with fake blood based on the rest of that costume. Yeah, he probably like hit it like a vein in his forehead or something. So like a place that he really shouldn't have done. It's just like, oh, wow, this is bleeding a lot more than we had expected. Um, ooh, better take the and wig off. They, the I clot think they right. should have tried to sell it. I really think they should have tried to sell that scene by having him wear a Les Nessman Band-Aid on his forehead through the rest of the movie. <laughs> Does anyone understand the whole uh, nuclear? Is it nuclear fusion or just fusion stuff? Cold fusion. Cold fusion. fusion. Yeah, they said because it eight hundred times. You think I'd have remembered it, but no. Yeah, like like uh, typical naturally occurring fusion. Just look at the sun. That's fusion. Hydrogen. You know the they might be giants. Taught me hydrogen is turned into helium at temperatures of millions of degrees. That's fusion. But she had cold fusion where you can somehow generate the energy without the heat. That's like the. The, the ultimate goal in energy production. And uh, somehow this movie, I don't know how, I don't know how any of this, this show works. It doesn't make any sense to me who's got what, how they're doing, whatnot. It's, it's, it's confusing and there's you know music playing constantly and therefore you can't understand three-fourths of the things that people are saying because the score is just so wildly abrasive and it is just the quintessential essential 90s over the top score that is just generic and crappy and is 
Ugh, and terrible. When you com- when you compare it to Mission Impossible or James Bond, it's severely lacking in action, and the la- the action it does have not that great. It's kind of, yeah, the action is super boring, and that's why it's just you, you can't you get to the next scene and you're like, all right, well, I guess that's the next and, logical step because again, and, not, not much I, happens. And I don't know, Sean, if if you see it this way or not, but I kind of feel like at some point. Probably Kilmer, but it might have been somebody else said, no, the saint is an intellectual action hero. So he's going to figure everything out. He doesn't need to run and jump and fight very much to to solve his problems. Well, you're right. Although it has the same problem that a lot of gadget movies do, which is that you are living in an age where a phone is the, you know, is where everything is now. It's on your phone. So whenever Val Kilmer pulls out that little pocket knife thing that's got, you know, like a camera in it and a bunch of other crap, um, 90% of what he's doing with that thing you can do with your phone. Yeah. But, but we're already in an age where he has a phone on him that is that, that cool like phone that was a cell phone that you could flip up and you could text yeah. also. I think they called those so, a two-way back in the day. I called them a what? A two-way. Yeah, I, th- I believe you're right. I believe it was called the two way. And like there's a cu- there there's like a couple of like simple apps on it also, you know, because it was almost like a like a palm pilot kind of a thing. Well, put that crap in your phone, dude. <laughs> like it, it's it's maddening when watching watching a movie like this where you're like, yeah, I realize that that knife is supposed to be the most awesome thing in the world, but it just looks like it looks like you're hitting people with a rock. I mean, honestly. <laughs> yeah. And uh, quite frankly, I could have even done with a little more hitting people with a rock in this movie. At least that would, have, would been, have been uh, action oriented. And then you think that was, is this listed as an action film on IMDb? What's the, yeah. Action adventure. I'm like, where's the, where's the action? It also now, says sci-fi, but I guess that may be I've the got, fusion I've got to talk bit. to you about this too, Adam. You were absolutely right about the composer of this movie, uh, Graham Revel. Um, Graham Revel, best known for The Saint, The Crow, Laura Croft, Tomb Raider. Like, are these are these movies where you're like, man, those? Nope, those are all awful scores. I know all of those Daredevil. movies. They're all terrible. And, and I think it goes beyond just the the composer of the score. I think when it comes to mixing, I know there's one scene where there's like a, uh, a an ambient song playing uh, in the scene, but there's also like heavy score. Where it's like the I almost had yeah. to like look around. And somebody had a radio on in the house, or somebody's phone was going off. But it was like the the ambient music would have worked. It was you know kind of that standard stuff that's in this movie. I, I don't know the the names of the bands, but they had a couple that they tried to promote as big hit singles of the summer when this came out. And it wasn't a bad ambient song, and even the score would have probably been passable. But it was like that mix where you just kind of hear a little bit of both is the sort of the most annoying way to to hear music. And they're not wholly complementary either, because I know that there are some things that do that, and like those two things can work in in harmony together. Pardon the pun. No, they start abruptly. But here it is just like you're going. Which one of these should we really be listening? It's like you really should have just turned one up and one down, like even a little bit. You didn't even have to, not even all the way off. Just put one a little bit more predominant than the other. That's all. And, this and movie is so old that Smashing Pumpkins is the cool song in this movie. <laughs> yeah, we, were, we still like Smashing Pumpkins in 1997. Who knew? Yeah. And there's a scene in this movie that stuck with me that I didn't realize it stuck with me from this movie. Like I would have thought it was from something in the eighties, like cold war era, but that scene where, uh, uh, I almost called her Emma Thompson, where Elizabeth Shue is just like running as fast as she can for the embassy. And there's like all these protesters outside <laughs> the gates. Locked. And then the, the, the soldiers are just standing there to open the gate for her and then immediately close it back. That seems so ridiculous to me that I've always wanted to try it because I have visited a few other countries, but <laughs> I've never tried just running as fast as I can at the embassy and screaming, "I'm an American! I'm an American!" I'm an American. I'm an American. I'm an American. Because they just and and they let her in so easily. It's just like, 
Well, she says she's American, and she's saying it in English, so not for nothing. I guess she's American. Let her in. Oh, the guy behind her. Let's go ahead and leave him out. He did not say he was American. What? That's all. May, is that all he had to say? Just go. I'm an American. You guys too. ain't factoring in that she is a very, very attractive lady. That's true. They're just like, well, this hot blonde is running to us, screaming she's American. We might as well let her on American soil. Turns out it was the Belgian embassy. They didn't care. It's just like, hey, we need more ladies around this. Place. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of it's kind of been getting boring around here. We got to have a new, a new lady to talk to. But I, I got to tell you, this is how gorgeous Elizabeth Shue is at this time, right? So I'm watching, I'm watching this god awful movie. Uh, my my lady comes walking out, and I'm watching this on the big TV. She comes out and she goes, "Wow, Elizabeth Shue is so beautiful. Too bad this movie sucks." And just kept walking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Correct, man, you are. This movie's old enough; it had an original Duran Duran song in it. An original Duran Duran song? <laughs> yes. And wow. uh, the, the hit single they were trying to promote was by the Sneaker Pimps, one of Sean's favorite bands, I bet. I, I've never even heard of them. You know? <laughs> like, that was a name that no. went around a lot. I don't remember any of the music, but, like, it is a name is it the name of a band that you rarely forget, the Sneaker Pimps. Yeah, I don't remember them at all. But according to this that I'm looking at, that's the song they were trying to make a hit. There's somebody that is all just 90 out. Go, no, bro, the, the sneaker pimps were the best. You don't understand. I'm like eh. something, something else that really bothers me about this movie is that the final 20 to 15 minutes, I'll say 15 minutes. I don't want to oversell it. But the final few minutes aren't great, but they're tolerable. And when I think, you know, they could have just made this whole movie tolerable or else they could have made the movie a short and I would have liked it. But, but that also kind of bugs me because at the end, it's some pretty, you know, cliche, straightforward uh, uh, Russia cold fusion bombs and all that kind of stuff. I could go with that. But it really bugged me that, like, man, nobody, nobody cares enough at this point for that to matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you've, you've uh, squandered three-fourths of a movie already. You can't just make it up here in the, in the last nine. It's not going to work it's, like it's that. Not, it's not Home Alone good at the last 15 minutes. You know, it's just taller. Yeah. Now, if it turned into Home Alone in the last 15 minutes, I'd be loving this movie. Well, also, don't forget that, you know, Kevin McAllister is doing a lot of the heavy lifting in that movie um, and is amazing all throughout, unlike Val Kilmer in this movie. Who's sitting around <laughs> and, and yeah. wooing ladies with the worst poetry you've ever heard, and it's just like... And although, the f- although to, to be fair, hmm. uh, you know, Val, Val Kilmer... Val Kilmer and Kevin McAllister are both, you know, real people. And Kevin McAllister doesn't have to actually act. He just has to be Kevin McAllister. Whereas Val Kilmer, you know, he has to be like 40 different people. Uh, All yeah, very convincingly. He, he was he was yeah. lobbying for more costume changes and they had to pump the brakes on him. Oh, without a doubt, because <laughs> they didn't even get to blackface guy. Uh, it's you like, I'm that sure. was there. yeah. Oh, man, you know, that was there. But. Um, yeah. I'll be honest, when they're plugging in the cold fusion, I was kind of wanting it to explode because, you know, a hydrogen bomb is just hot fusion. So I just wouldn't have minded if it just blew up like an H-bomb, took out all of Moscow, everybody in the movie, every major character gone, and the movie would have just ended because I was ready for it to be over It just point. ends in black. <laughs> just beep, three, two, yeah, one, there, black There credits. is something bad about a movie where you're rooting for the bad guys. And there were several times in this movie where I was kind of rooting for the bad guys. <laughs> yeah, get them. <laughs> and then when they plug in their glorified lava lamp, they're supposed to sell us on the fact that it works, but... Like, I don't even know how you would prove to a bunch of people on the street just looking that it's working. I mean, you could stack some high-powered batteries under it, and it would look like it was putting out energy. Yeah, it, it, listen, none of it makes sense. I, I, I just wanted it to be like um, Raiders of the Lost Ark ending, where all of a sudden the cold fusion ghosts come out and kill everybody, and Val Kilmer has to tell Elizabeth <laughs> Shoot not to look. Dude, I'm tell- you want to talk about a movie I'd re- I would have enjoyed watching? <laughs> Would have liked that a lot better. But you know yeah. what else I would like a lot better than that? I would like to know how this movie relates back one-to-one with Sylvester Stallone. Oh, man. Adam, thank you. I have a prepared statement. Oh. Peter Young was the set decorator on The Saint. He's been working in film and television since 1974 when he worked on what I would imagine to be the entire art department on a movie called Ghost Story. 
which was made for BBC. He would go on to work on Superman 2 and 3, Supergirl and the Dark Crystal. But Peter Young is best known for his collaborations with Tim Burton. He started with him on Batman and worked with him all the way throughout Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And there is no way that that is an easy job. I imagine Tim Burton would come up to him and say things like, can you find me a chair that looks like it was designed by a 13-year-old girl who chain smokes? <laughs> or, I want a table, but it's a table that looks like it's throwing up. <laughs> or, do you know where we can find a record player that looks like an antique, but it also looks like it plays the screams of the souls of the damned? <laughs> and guess what? Peter Young did find that furniture. Where did he find it? I have no idea. Where do you shop for bunk beds that look like they were made for conjoined twins? I'm not the right person to ask. I'm just a podcaster with no discernible life skills. Peter Young also happened to work on Judge Dredd, which stars a man that once said the reason why the movie Judge Dredd didn't work is because it wasn't funny enough. Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> Peter Young is still working in the, in the industry, but nothing we've ever heard of, at least not recently. And let's call a David Spade a David Spade. He's earned the right to downshift. It's not easy finding window treatments that also look like they want to strangle grandpa. <laughs> and there you have it, HMP. This week's Stallone connection is set decorator Peter Young. You're welcome. I'm Sean Kovacs. You're welcome. I got I got to be honest with you. I was I was I was I didn't know if it would be there or not, but I was hoping for some sort of Robert Evans connection because man, oh man, the late the the, the late great Robert Evans just died last year and uh if ever there was a guy where stories could be told and I think two people could have had quite the adventure, it would have been Robert Evans and Stallone for sure. Well, the the problem though is that the Robert Evans joke has been done to death. The, that that I'm going to ask, am I going to ask a question only I'm going to answer? You bet I am. Like that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Whereas with this, I actually, like, I was like, oh, I, I got a new bit for this. Like, this is an interesting bit, the furniture and Tim Burton movie. No, I listen, I, I love it. I mean, to, to me, that's one of the best parts about this is that I, I don't look for things I don't like. Because I used to when we first started, you know, I'd go like, oh, let me see what he might kind of try to connect it to. I'd let it go now, and i go like, oh, I wonder if it's this or that or the other. But uh, I, I always like learning the new stuff, so thank you for that. Sure. Uh, but before we get down to it, though, uh, just remember, uh, email us, heromoviepodcast at gmail.com if you have any uh, thoughts or ideas. We're always kind of jumping around different movies and things of that nature, and we'll talk about what we're going to be doing Thank next you. week uh, as well. Uh, but it, before we get to this, we have to talk about the Robin rating system, everybody. The Robin rating system, you can find that over at facebook.com slash heromoviepodcast. It's right there at the top of the screen. That's how you decode our rating system. And of course, uh, see some fun memes and stuff that we'll post up on, on the wall there. Have yourself a good old time facebook.com slash hero movie podcast bruce where does this saint fall on the robin rating system for you well i just want to start off by sharing something that a guy named liam lacy he used to be a, a movie reviewer i'm pretty sure he can't find work doing that now but he used to work for the toronto globe and he said the saint is more entertaining than mission impossible or goldeneye where and is the cocaine that he was doing that no, man, man that, no way. He's a paid guy. Yeah, that man has uh, lost his, his professional trust amongst the movie-going audience, I think. Because mm. I'm taking yeah, Mission Impossible and Goldeneye all day long before this. Wow. And uh, I will say there's a, a made-for-TV pilot that got turned into a movie like five years after the pilot wasn't picked up that has Eliza Dushku in it, like I said before. It's not bad. I mean, it's not going to change your, your life or anything, but compared to this, man, it's way better. But this movie is it really deserves what I think is the avoid at all costs rating, which isn't the Jason Todd, because some of those are like accidents that are so bad you have to see it. This film's competently made in a lot of ways. It's just dull. You know, it's as, it's, it's as dull as those safety scissors they used to give me in kindergarten. So I'm giving it the, the Stephanie Brown rating. Yeah, Sean, what do you got? Well, you know, Adam Portress once said it best when he said, the worst thing you can do is make a boring movie. Thank you. And, and uh, <laughs> this is a boring movie. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not terrible. It's just terrible. 
And uh, it's a shame because they have almost everything in place to make this great. Uh, something that I didn't bring up that I really wanted to bring up is that when you see this movie, like if, if you somehow leapfrog over everything we've just said about how you shouldn't see this movie and you see this movie anyway, keep in mind that his character, that the, the Val Kilmer character is not real for a single frame in this movie. He is pretending to be someone else. And when you are being that person, when you are not a real human being, there are literally no stakes for anyone anywhere. You don't believe that anyone is in imminent danger. You don't believe that the world is going to get blown up. You don't believe any of it because he doesn't believe it. And so that is the massive, massive problem with this movie. And I never brought that up and I just wanted to. So there you go. It, it is a Stephanie Brown. Yeah, Stephanie Brown all around. Uh, I, I remember, like like I said uh, last week, I was like, I, I remember seeing this in around 97 and just going like, oh, I, th- I, th- I thought that was good. It, apparently, it was one of those times where you're just, you know, 17 years old and you just don't know any better. <laughs> and I, because this is just, it's not good. It's, it's just, it's so boring. It's, and again, you're right. It's not so bad that you, you know, hate the dickens out of it. Uh, but there is, it's frustrating because it feels like there is absolutely something under here that could have been a decent movie had enough of the right elements been changed. And uh, yeah, it's kind of unfortunate. But maybe we'll, uh, maybe at some point uh, further on in our future, we'll cover some other sort of saintly uh, project and stuff like that. Uh, but before we talk about next week's episode, let's find out where we can find more of your work on the internet, Bruce. I would like for people to go check out Nerd Spawn Genesis on uh, Amazon, Amazon.com, Amazon.uk, etc. Started off the new year with the new review, so I'm just going to remind people that that's out there. Maybe you go check that out. The ebook's priced affordably. The uh, paperback makes a nice keepsake. Sean, what do you got? Uh, you can hear from me if you are in the hotel room right next to me because I can hear everything that's happening next door right now. So go ahead and check out that hotel that I'm in. Uh, you, you will be pleasantly rewarded with me yelling at the TV, uh, by me uh, talking on the phone, and by me uh, speaking to my good friends Adam and Bruce over the interweb. Uh, also, you can find me on Twitter at Sean Kovacs4. That's sweet Seanzy from the internet. Exclamation point. The exclamation point is for the exclamatoriness of it all. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so please do that. And of course, like I said, uh, patreon.com slash HMP. Next week, uh, we're going to be talking Polar. That is a movie that is on Netflix starring Mads Mikkelsen, uh, Vanessa Hudgens, and uh, more. So uh, we'll be checking that out. And, of course, talking about the comic book relationship and, of course, the relationship to one Sylvester Stallone. That is it, everybody. Join us next week for our review of Polar. For Sweet Shanzi from the Internet, Bruce Leslie, I'm Adam Portress. Stay super, everybody. Goodbye, Marty and Evie.